opening scene, a man has a dream of death. A mysterious woman draws him back to life. He meets her later, by chance. He recognizes her from his dream. Does she recognize him? No. He follows her obsessively. She is elusive, mysterious. She is wounded by life in some way. Mr. Gold, I saw a woman here to see you. You don't mind this. People deny things, journalists make things up. Keeps us honest. Uh, no, sure. Ivan Hitchin? Yes. He just kept on painting the same landscape over and over. Never got it right, I guess. <laughs> well, I happen to believe he was trying to penetrate that landscape. In the end, he wasn't painting trees and rivers, but their meaning. I'll do you a favor. I won't print that. It would read so pretentious. It does. You know it's pretentious? Then why say it? Say something. Do something. Shut up. Take it easy. Thank you, Bridget. I think that's why the cup is so warm. And cup. Ah. <laughs> you want some coffee? Sure. Creepy coffee table. As a matter of fact, it's a Celtic sarcophagus. Some critics have said there's an unhealthy obsession with death in your movies. How do you feel about your own death? The way I feel now, I'd rather die than do this interview. And why did you agree? Surely you know my reputation. The only reason you're here, my dear, is because I want to use your magazine to promote my film. Great. We want to exploit each other. Perfect grounds for a modern relationship. Speaking of which, I read somewhere that you were very taken with that quote from Citizen Kane, where the guy says that he glimpsed this girl getting off the Staten Island ferry. Never saw her again, but there wasn't a day went by in 20 years when he didn't think of her. Is that how you see women? Mysterious, elusive? Well, the women in Hope and Glory were earthy and raunchy enough, weren't they? But they were your mother and aunt and sisters. They probably disgusted you. So, you reach out for this idea of woman, sort of distant and unattainable and therefore safe. And also, she has to carry all this symbolic baggage, like she's Mother Nature and Isis, the Lady of the Lake, etc. I mean, do you really believe all this mystical stuff? This is disastrous. Can't you stop it? Can't you rewind it? Can't you make her how we want her to be? Start again? Have you ever actually had a mystical experience? You can't see him, can you? Who? Are you having me on? No. You call yourself a Jungian. Wasn't Carl Jung just a convenient scientific justification for your pet ideas about man's alienation from nature, uh, Merlin as a magician mediator, the quest for the Holy Grail, all those woolly notions about harmony and oneness. Do I get a chance to answer some of these questions? Sure, go ahead. Well, let's take Merlin, for example. Yes, he's very real to me. He lives in my imagination. We converse. But has he ever appeared physically, like in this room? No, of course not. No, so it's all so much fantasy and movie. You can't see him, can you? Actually, him. <laughs> you pulled that one already. No, really. <gasps> Look, I absolutely do not believe that you can possibly exist. You are not yourself. I know. <laughs> I'm not like this. I'm 
someone else. All men are liars. And you have devoted your life to finding them out. Yes. But it took me into someone I don't like. It's a terrible thing not to feel at home in your own skin, to be a stranger in a strange land. You are not alone. So it was with me. So it is with him. But you came to the right place. Not far from here is Glendalough. Long ago, a man called Kevin came there. He also was lost to himself. In the sixth century, the man Kevin came to this remote place and lived up here as a hermit in a tiny cell and stared at the lake and meditated. Such was his reputation that he attracted hundreds of fervent followers and a great monastery grew up. Probably Kevin came here because the Druids had founded a holy place before him. So what was the power it possessed? What was Kevin doing? Praying, I suppose. But why here? And why did this supremely passive act arouse such wild excitement? His disciples knew he was onto something. Glendalough is one of the essential tourist stops in Ireland. They are told it is a holy place. The holiest of all. They flock here, as Kevin's followers did. When they arrive, they're disappointed. They look at the lake, hoping to feel something. But there is no ritual, no ceremony to help them. At shrines all over the world, you see the same blank expression on them as the secular present peers at the magical past. Is it quite dead, that past? I dreamt I was trying to reach Kevin's bed. I knew if I could only get there, some important mystery would be revealed. Can you hear that? No, what? A great force coming from the lake. I often come here hoping to feel Surely you can feel it. Terrifying. A great force was coming from the lake. It was, how can I describe it? Like naked power. It was terrifying because it had no purpose, no objective. Not good, not evil. It was just itself. And I understood that what the druids and the monks were doing was to harness that power to the cause of good. And now nobody is watching. Nobody cares. And it is running wild. Blind, destructive. And in other lives. And you will. The word is not. long ago, before Kevin, before the Druids. It is the wounds. 